Dr. Robert Quinn initially trained as a microbial ecologist, obtaining his PhD from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette in 2012. He then applied this ecological theory to infections of humans during his postdoctoral research at San Diego State University and the University of California at San Diego. Dr. Quinn's lab at Michigan State applies microbial ecology theory and high tech multi-omics methods to understand human and animal microbiomes. His lab specifically studies the cystic fibrosis lung, human gut, and coral reefs. He has received awards from the Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, Metabolomics Association of North America, and grant funding from the National Institutes of Health and Nature Research. All right, so I'll just get right to it. A deep dive into mucus, poop, and tropical reefs. And to be honest, we can dive a lot deeper into each of these issues. And my lab studies these three areas, and I'll just briefly touch on some recent research uh, from each of them. Um, as you can see, you know, the first two are some of the most disgusting substances on earth. And maybe the third one is a reprieve from the prior two. Um, and this coral reef stuff that I'd kind of been involved with, with for quite some time, my PhD was in marine microbiology. I wasn't sure if I'd be able to do as an independent professor here at Michigan State, but the resources that were given to me, some friends and connections, it's really become a very active area of research in my lab, and I'm, I'm really hope to keep doing it. There. Okay. We, really true, we are a walking ecosystem. So any person in this room or walking around the planet today is made up of approximately 30 trillion cells. Now, in and on those 30 trillion cells are about 40 trillion bacteria. So I, by this measure, you're about one-to-one -one host cells to microbial cells, which comes as a surprise to many people. It's actually still some pretty hot debate about what that ratio actually is. It probably depends on whether or not you went to the bathroom in the morning. But estimates... Uh, well, we know that the human genome is made of approximately 20,000 genes. We've heard the diversity of our genetic complement, and that's very true. But estimates of the genetic diversity in the human microbiome are on the order of 600,000 genes. So by this measure, we're 30 to 1 micro. There's more genetic potential in the bacteria that live on and in our bodies than are on our own genome. So my philosophy in my lab, and it's not only mine, is that there's immense power here. And Hema talked a bit about the power in more environmental systems to remediate metals. There's immense power if we can harness this genetic complement of the microbiome to improve health and maybe ameliorate disease. But this isn't just about humans. So it's true that all multicellular organisms host a microbiome. And each one of these organisms I've studied for quite some time, actually my PhD on lobsters. Um, and corals are a great example because they're one of the most deeply branching extant multicellular organisms on earth. Corals are kind of like an upside down epithelium you know, upside down, but they have a cellular layer that coats in mucus and exposes to the marine environment instead of our gut, like our airways or our gut. So that's why, how I try to sell the similarities. But what my lab is doing a lot of lately, and we know, is that the microbiome interacts with our bodies through chemistry. And there's really four ways that we know that this happens. The first being primary metabolite production. So microbes make small molecules from their core metabolic pathways that we simply don't have the genes to produce. We pick them up in our bodies, we know they're microbial. They also make specialized metabolites. So microbes have this ability to make these complex molecules from often complex genetic machinery, some of which have pretty strong physiological effects on our bodies. What we see a lot of evidence for, for when we go looking for this is modification of host molecules and mod modification of xenobiotics, which are things that you ingest. So microbes are messing with molecules that we make and they're messing with molecules that we take in, particularly drugs. And there's a lot of uh, understanding now that many drugs that we take, including some statin drugs, are actually activated by the microbiome. And that part of the reason some people don't respond is they don't have the right bacteria. So just to give you kind of a visual idea of what I'm talking about, it's the microbial metabolome. And all these ohms, so don't blame me for getting confused as to which one you were saying, metabolome, microbiome, it's all confusing, but it's all kind of this idea of grabbing data and information from these complex systems and putting it together with computers, frankly. But what we're looking at here is the production of all these small molecules by our gut bacteria. So keep that in mind as I go through the talk. Now, I'm avoiding the technical stuff that we do, but like many of the labs and many people you heard today, there's a lot of hardcore science and technology behind this. But I'll touch on this idea quickly. One method that we use in my lab is called LCMS-MS metabolomics. Again, we have mass spectrometers that measure the mass of molecules, can characterize the compounds that are in these samples, and they do so extremely accurately. 
Mass spectrometers are some of the most advanced technology on the planet. And they read these molecules from microbes or really from anything as spectra, which are kind of like fingerprints. But the point I was going to make is that, which you can't see because of that, but that's okay, I'll explain, is that we kind of suck at analyzing the data. Like the mass specs are extremely accurate. They're extremely high throughput. And even in some of the best studied samples on Earth, like a mouse fecal sample or human blood, we can only identify about 20% of the molecules that we detect. There's an immense amount of discovery there. So back to kind of the roadmap of my lab here. Um, I'm going to talk first about cystic fibrosis, and I'll mention that this image here is from an artist named Dylan Mortimer. Uh, we're going to have Dylan here October 13th uh, for a research and art celebration event that we were trying to organize in March of 2020. Imagine that didn't end up happening with a bunch of physicians and patients in a room. Uh, but check out his website, dylanmortimer.com. His art is incredible. He depicts his disease in many ways and also just kind of his experience. Okay, so I'll talk about CF, and I've been studying CF for quite some time. My postdoc in San Diego was really about cystic fibrosis. Now, CF is a chronic polymicrobial infection, but it's actually caused by mutation in a gene called CFTR. So it's a genetic disease in humans, and CFTR is expressed in the epithelium, so your cell layer, of a number of tissues, your lungs, your gut, your pancreas, a few other places. The responsibility of CFTR is to transport negatively charged ions across the membrane. But people with CF have a dysfunction, a mutation in this protein, and it doesn't work properly. It's somewhat of a complex physiology how this happens, but people with cystic fibrosis have this buildup of thick, sticky mucus on their airway surface. How many people in the room know someone that has cystic fibrosis? There you go. It's more common than you think, although it's a rare disease. Um, now, as a consequence of this thick mucus buildup, people get in, these people get infected with bacteria, really from early in their life, they have a higher bacterial load in their lungs than a healthy person. And over time, they build this complex community of microbes in their lungs that is really like an infectious microbiome. So the CF lung microbiome, the thing I've been studying for like eight years, is really a microbiome that shouldn't be there. And we're trying to get rid of it. One aspect of CF that's helpful for us is that we know a lot about the bacteria that infect these individuals. The gut microbiome has anywhere from hundreds to thousands of species most of which we don't really know anything about. But in cystic fibrosis, we know a lot about the bacteria that are there, and it makes a great experimental microcosm for microbiomes in general. One of the real market aspects of CF is the requirement for antibiotics. So patients take kilograms upon kilograms of antibiotics throughout their lifetime, and it has a strong selective pressure on the microbes that live there. And sadly, it is ultimately a terminal disease. And people with cystic fibrosis ultimately succumb to the disease primarily to do complications from lung infection, but that may have changed in November 2021, 2019, sorry, and I'll explain why. So as was men Phil mentioned, I'm a microbial ecologist, at least I like to say that. And I approach these kind of, you know, really clinical problems at, from that angle. And when I started reading about cystic fibrosis, when I got this fellowship to go to San Diego, I kept reading about these mucus plugged bronchioles, which are essentially tubes, your lung tubes full of mucus. Now, as a microbial ecologist, we kind of think of it this way. So this is how we study the CF lung microbiome. It sets up in these plugged airways. And from first principles, we know there are bacteria in there. And from first principles, we know that this will set up chemical gradients. And we've actually pretty extensively studied this. It can show how the microbes stratify based on oxygen, which penetrates from the top, the upper airway, but is really anoxic in the bottom. So it's kind of, kind of counterintuitive, but there are many anaerobic anoxic bacteria in the airways of people with CF. And just as an aside, and maybe Hemo will appreciate this, uh, this is kind of an homage to my scientific hero, Dr. Sergei Vinogradsky, who in the late 1890s was studying really microbiomes in the sediment. He would grab sludge from a freshwater lake, put it up to a window and study how microbial communities stratify in chemical gradients. We do the same thing in cystic fibrosis and a lot of the fundamental principles remain. But the one little story I wanted to tell is about amino acids and disease severity. So with our metabolomics methods, our LCMS, MS, complicated stuff that I'll save you for another day, what we found is one of the strongest associations with severe disease in the mucus of people with CF were amino acids. People that were really sick had lots and lots of amino acids and those that were less sick did not. So what we know is happening actually is that in the airways, there are neutrophils and these bacteria, maybe I'll back up. So these pathogens, Pseudomonas aeruginosa in particular, which you may have heard of, the terrible bacterium, 
eats amino acids as its principal food source. And the presence of a pseudomonas causes inflammation, and particularly neutrophils, which are a, an immune cell that you um, that respond to bacteria. If you ever popped a pimple, a lot of the time you're really just kind of releasing the neutrophils. They're very much responsive to bacterial infections. And what neutrophils do is they bring with them an enzyme called neutrophil elastase, which is really like a Pac-Man that just chops, chops, chops up protein. So what we find in people that are very sick with CF, they have lots and lots of peptides and lots and lots of amino acids in their lung. And we believe that it essentially feeds this bacterium. It's been a long time question of why this bacterium that we find in freshwater on plants seems to dominate in this environment of a human lung that's got every effort to try to kill it. We think because it can survive the neutrophils and feeds on the product of their, um, their amino acid production. And this could not be understated. So there's a drug that come out. The truth is it's actually a triple therapy, trikafta, that is a true game changer for CF. And it is kind of a crazy story. I got a, a large grant from the National Institutes of Health, which was a great moment for me. In uh, with August 2019, I think the funds hit the bank. In November 2019, this drug came out and changed everything. Almost all the goals of my project don't happen anymore in CF. So don't tell the NIH that, but I'm working through it. Anyway, so this drug, it's just had a remarkable effect on the lung function. This is just showing improvements from clinical trials. I had nothing to do with this drug. Don't give me the credit. But it is a beautiful story, actually, how pharmaceutical companies uh, do have some uh, true good behind what they try to do. We've been studying this. So we collected samples before people took Trikafta and after they took Trikafta. This is, again, about these peptides. What we see in this little graph here is that before TKT, they have lots of peptides and lots of amino acids. When on the drug, within a few months, they start to go down. So what we think is happening then is Trikafta is actually reversing this microbial ecology in the lung. So the niche space, think about a niche being like the deer that feed in the, the farms just behind my house in the northern part of East Lansing. They live in a niche, right? And the bacteria in the lung live in a niche sort of similarly. Pseudomonas' niche is to eat amino acids. What we think is happening is Trikafta is just reversing the clock. We're watching the microbial ecology go away. And a lot of the follow-up studies are really validating what we published last year. And eventually, pseudomonas is going to be gone. And it's no longer detectable in the majority of patients on Trikafta. They can't even culture this bacterium anymore. If you're ever in a bad mood or having a tough day, you could go, uh, YouTube Trikafta CF on YouTube. There are some just absolutely uplifting stories of people talking about what it feels like to take this drug. And there's a person in my lab who has cystic fibrosis on Trikafta, and this person's story is very similar. It's really remarkable. But again, no credit to me. <laughs> so switching gears, talking about poop. And it's very true. And my, my first grad student, uh, he rotated in my lab and I handed him 1,400 infant fecal samples that we collect at the University of Michigan. And in retrospect, the fact that he chose my lab was pretty surprising, but he's still wrangling poop to this day. And I'll explain why. So I, for a long time, I kind of avoided gut microbiome research. Most of the bacteria in our body are in our distal colon because it's sort of a saturated field. But we made a pretty fundamental discovery when I was a postdoc in California that is now translated here to Michigan State. So I'll give you this diagram here, which is my highly physiologically accurate depiction of the mammalian gastrointestinal tract that I drew in PowerPoint. And in the liver, we have what are called bile and bile acids in particular. So you guys associate bile, perhaps undergraduates, associate bile with you know, too much drinking and you can taste your bile the next morning. But really, bile and bile acids are a fundamental sludge, if you will, and molecules for our digestion, okay? So our liver makes a molecule called cholic acid, which looks like a steroid. It's actually synthesized from cholesterol. And the only way our body excretes cholesterol, the primary way, is through the synthesis of bile acids, which makes them pretty important there too. And what we're more specifically studying is an enzyme in our liver called BAT. And the responsibility of BAT is to take cholic acid and an amino acid, and it conjugates them. That's the final step in the synthesis of bile acids, which then go into our gut. What's interesting about BAT is it only uses one of two amino acids called taurine or glycine. Taurine is the stuff that you read inside of a Red Bull can. Why they put taurine in Red Bull? No idea. <laughs> so when the bile acids are made, the amino acids are added, it's stored in our gallbladder, and we have a meal that's injected into our duodenum. Then they start to do their work. The job of a bile acid is to solubilize fat. 
So they help us absorb our fat. So if you have a bunch of nacho cheese, your bile acids are doing their work and help you absorb your fat. Almost as, as soon as the bile acids get into the gut, microbes, your microbiome starts to mess with them. And they do so in a particular way. There's an enzyme that bacteria have called bile salt hydrolase. So that poor fat enzyme in your liver is going all this effort to add the amino acids on. As soon as the microbes encounter it, they take them off. It's not totally understood why. These bile acids make their way through your gut. They help dissolve your fat. They get to your distal colon. This is a mouse. Mice have cecum. We don't have a cecum. But ultimately, you're pooping out these microbial modified bile acids. There's been work on this really since the 70s. The book's basically been written uh, about how bacteria do this. Another important point is there's this really efficient system called hepatic circulation, where your bile acids are actually recirculated back to your liver. So there's a lot of interest in this for cholesterol treatment, because I said excreting bile acids is one of the primary ways to get rid of cholesterol in your body. Uh, but this efficient system kind of hijacks that when you absorb, but it's good because you don't want to waste all your bile acids. So what we discovered in 2020, right before the pandemic, which may or may not have been a good thing, I don't know. You can kind of ignore this complicated graph, but it comes from that metabolomics, LC, MS, MS stuff I'm telling you. Each little node here represents a molecule. And the molecules are colored by whether or not you can't see it, unfortunately. Pink is shared. So you can actually grow what are called germ-free mice. So we can use mice that don't have a microbiome. They're sterile, which is pretty amazing. People have been doing it since the late 50s, which is pretty surprising. You can... Study germ-free mice compared to normal mice. So the pink are molecules that are found in both types of mice. The green are molecules only found with mice with a microbiome. And the blue are the mice that are only found, molecules only found in sterile mice. Okay, so that's just kind of a map, if that makes sense. So what we were looking for in this study were these green things. We're trying to discover molecules from the microbiome. And we highlight them as green because they're only found in normal mice. And here what we're showing is that in that little part of the graph up here, is the molecule glycocholic acid. So this arrow-shaped molecule is the one that the BAT enzyme makes in our liver. These molecules around it that we don't know what they are, interestingly, our masses are different by the substitution of a different amino acid, either tyrosine, phenylalanine, or leucine. So the mass difference between this and these three is an amino acid substitution. And it was really one of those moments in science that's truly remarkable when you know you've discovered something no one's seen before. And you can just immediately think of the downstream effects, right? What we had discovered was that there are uniquely conjugated bile acids in our gut made by the microbiome, and they add different amino acids on. And it turned out that we started looking in the literature that this might be kind of a big deal. The first toracolic and the glycocolic acid, the ones made by the liver, were first structurally described in 1848. We knew so much about bile acids in 1928 that the Nobel Prize was given for basically writing the book. And the presentation was given by Henrik Wieland, The Chemistry of Bile Acids. And frankly, not a lot has changed until last year, or 2020, time passes. Um, we published this paper in Nature that described a, the finding of an entire new complement of bile acids in, uh, in mice, but they're also found in humans. So some of this informatics omic stuff that I've kind of glossed over, what we're able to do is search molecules in public data. So we have this leucine conjugated microbial bile acid that no one ever knew existed before. We can take its little fingerprint and search all the data sets that are out there in the world. And we get hits, and sometimes these hits are to our friends. So we have a collaborator, Curtis Huttenhauer at Harvard. We know that these molecules are particularly abundant in subjects with Crohn's disease. So we don't know whether there's a role in Crohn's disease, but we see a lot of these microbial bile acids in sick people, but also in infants. This graph's covered up. But um, down the highways where all those 1,400 baby poop samples came from, which I literally trucked, in the, it rented a pickup truck and put them in oil barrels and drove them down the highway. I had to sign a bunch of forms that if I crashed, like I'd clean up all the baby poop. Thankfully, I made it. Um, anyway, so we see a lot of them in infants and particularly very early on in life. We have no idea why. Another one of these complicated graphs, the detail isn't all that important, but what's so Fantastic about this is we can reproduce their production in the laboratory. So we have bacteria that we can get out of our gut, add a bile acid and an amino acid, and they will make these new microbial compounds so we can study them. And they make a lot of different ones. So there's a variety of amino acids that, you, uh, that are available to human body, and microbes seem to conjugate just about all of them. And the real question is, what do they do, right? 
And we're trying to convince the NIH that we have some kind of an idea, and maybe we're making some headway. But one thing we know is that bile acids are inherently antimicrobial. So they're detergents, right? Not that different from soap. So when you, there's a lot of bile around, guts, bacteria don't do well. And what we've shown is that you can't really see here, but these are different bile acids. This is the unconjugated cholic acid I talked about. And this green one is toracolic acid. That's made in the liver. And on the y-axis here is the growth of the bacterium Staphylococcus aureus, which is a pathogen. So the unconjugated form is very antimicrobial, but then the liver conjugated form is not. And then these microbial ones have the various degrees of antimicrobial activity. And this is a phenylalanine, which is a very hydrophobic amino acid. So the more hydrophobic the conjugate, the more antimicrobial they are. And this is another moment in science. Not as exciting, although in the end, sort of uh, similar in some ways. A scoop. I don't know how many people have experienced a true scoop before, but my poor graduate student, and if you guys watch TV, I don't know how many people actually get this, this reference, but it was a funny commercial, uh, and it really made me think about scoop. There it is. And a paper came out just last fall that scooped us pretty bad, um, where they actually showed that most of the bacteria in our gut can do this process, this conjugation of bile acids. And it, we weren't lucky in finding that bacterium. Lots and lots of bacteria do this. And I guess I can give the hint now, just last Friday, we discovered the gene that makes them. And it's actually bile salt hydrolase itself. But shh, don't tell anybody that. Um, what was I gonna say? So yeah, anyway, this is a great paper. Getting scoop kind of sucks. My poor grad student, I had a bit of a talk to him about it, but really it's a good thing, right? Because it means people are studying these things and people care. So it's been exciting. So the conclusion from the bile acid work is to me, we have a lot of work to do. Like we thought this was written in stone. I teach a medical class for the College of Human Medicine and I teach at some aspects of gastroenterology and I teach about these bile acids and I'm like, actually class, this is not correct. So we've really changed some fundamental understanding of human bile. And I think the story is that we really don't understand this nearly as well as we thought we did. And a lot of this was kind of done in the 60s and 70s, and the textbooks have been written. Totally shifting gears, but again, mucosal associated microbial communities, just like the lung and the gut, are coral reefs. So here's a, a GIF I stole from BBC Earth. Imagine the BBC is probably not happy about that, but they're a little busy reporting on their partying prime minister. So I think I'll be all right. Um, and this is a, a pristine reef, a truly healthy reef, right? And you can see the diversity. We talked a lot about diversity. We can quantify diversity in lots of ways. We do it in our microbial ecology and we do it on reefs. Different types of coral, different fish, healthy reef. This is what a lot of reefs look like these days. Bleached. And the term bleached is almost self-evident, right? Like they turn white. And this happens because of thermal stress. So we've all heard about global warming. We're all terrified. The predictions are getting not so great. And this is what happens when the temperature gets too hot on a reef. They turn white. They don't always die. They can survive. But if it's really severe and prolonged, the reefs, the corals will die. The reason this happens is that corals are a true symbiont, a really interesting organism. They're a, a hybrid organism or a uh, a symbiont between a coral animal, so a eukaryotic animal, and an algae. And the algae actually lives inside their cells. The algae is a beautiful name. It's called symbiodinium, which is fun to say. You can see the little algae living inside the cell. They photosynthesize. They provide the coral energy. The coral gives the algae sugar, et cetera, et cetera, or vice versa, sorry. Um, and here's an example of the bleached and the healthy coral. So the story I'm trying to get to is that in 2015, there was this really strong El Nino event, Southern Oscillation, some of the highest recorded water temperatures in the Pacific Basin ever uh, recorded. I have a bit of a personal experience for that that I'll quickly go over. So I was living in California at the time. I used to surf as much as I could, maybe at least a couple of times a week. And there was this bizarre event of this huge bloom of what are called tuna crabs. Tuna crabs are these pelagic crabs that usually live in the Southern Mexico. And they like, like totally invaded California beaches. And we're, me and my friends were surfing, paddling through these crabs, literally pushing them out of the way. And it was record high water temperatures in Southern California as well. Meanwhile, in Kaneo Hei Bay in Hawaii, corals had this massive bleaching event. What was so weird about that was that you have these two corals physically adjacent to each other, they're the same species. And when the water gets hot, one coral bleaches and the other one doesn't. So what's different about these two organisms? 
that was the big question. So again, this is in 2015 in the East Coast of Hawaii. In 2019, when I was here in my lab, Michigan State, getting things set up and getting things going, our friends at the University of Hawaii, the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, which is actually right on the bay. So the, the reef there, this is the, uh, the station. So it's quite a nice place to work. You have to take a boat across the reef to get to the Hawaii Institute. Um, these two corals, particularly adjacent, were tagged. So when that event happened, they tagged which ones bleached, which ones didn't. And then four years later, they sampled them during a time of not bleaching, so in the winter, and shipped the samples to my lab. So this graph here shows each sample is the metabolome, all the molecules that we detected from the coral. How close each sample is to each other indicates how similar the chemical profiles are. And I'm coloring by whether or not they're bleached or not bleached. So four years later, during a time of health, after this thermal event, the corals have completely different biochemistry. And we wanted to figure out why. Turns out the main driver of that signature are these kind of bizarre lipids called betaine lipids, which I had to Google. Sometimes I feel like a professional Googler. I think a lot of professors get that. Um, and they're actually found in the algae itself. So these lipids are unique. They don't have phosphorus. They're kind of like our phospholipids. They're only found in algae. Interestingly, a world expert in betaine lipids is across the street from my lab. I can wave to him. So that was a convenient thing for me. But anyway, the difference between corals that bleached in 2015 and those that did not was the presence of this saturation of these fatty acids of these unique lipids. So pretty heavy biochemistry here, but ultimately what it really shows is the difference between butter and margarine. So corals that were susceptible to thermal stress in the Hawaii Kaneohe Bay have lots of unsaturated fatty acids, which is like the oil. And the corals that are resistant have highly saturated fatty acids in this lipid group, which is like the butter, which might make sense because they have different um, melting temperatures, right? And the work we're doing now that I'm really excited about um, shows that this biochemical characteristic is inheritable. So coral reproduction is a Netflix video. You guys ever seen uh, Chasing Corals on Netflix? That's actually from the lab that I work with in uh, Hawaii. And they show pictures of coral reproduction. Corals spawn during a new moon once or twice a summer. And it's really a remarkable thing. They spit their eggs into the water and the water is all covered in their eggs and the sperm comes out. And then they come together and they colonize and make a new coral. It's beautiful. And what we find is when we sample the corals at every life stage of reproduction, this same biochemistry remains. So now we're actually moving towards reef restoration in Hawaii, that we can actually use our mass spec methods to say this coral's resistant, this coral's not, selectively breed and outplant back on the reef. And that's exactly what's happening in Hawaii right now. So with that, I'll say thank you, everybody. If you've driven down Wilson Road, you might notice this big goofy microbiome in our windows. Once I realized that I could fit the word microbiome in a Windows, I kind of figured I had to try something like this. I didn't know it was going to be quite so like loud and noticeable, but it's kind of an advertisement. We're trying to get people in my lab. And if you know young students looking to do uh, really any of this work, microbiomes, let me know and uh, we'd be happy to have them join. Thanks. <laughs>